Greetings, I am Dr. Silo Manoto from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. The title of my presentation is Investigating Optical Spectroscopy Techniques and Nanomaterials for Virus Detection. This is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to start by giving a brief introduction on point of care diagnostics or POC. I will then take you through the aim of the study, the methodology applied, what we found, conclude, and share some acknowledgements. Viral infections pose significant health challenges globally by affecting millions of people worldwide and consequently resulting in a negative impact on both socioeconomic development and health. Coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 is a clear example of how a virus can have a global impact in the society and has demonstrated the limitations of detection and diagnostic capabilities globally. Another virus which has posed serious threats to world health is the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, which is a lengthy virus of retroviridae family responsible for causing acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. Even though there has been a significant progress in the HIV biosensing over the past years, there is still a great need for the development of point-of-care diagnostics. Point-of-care diagnostics or POC are important in resource-limited settings and remote areas of the world for performing medical diagnosis, nutrition examination, and environmental monitoring. Over the past few years, there has been a growing demand to improve and simplify the effectiveness of diagnostics without compromising the quality of patient care. In order to increase the accessibility of treatment for patients in resource-limited settings of developing countries, a lot of work has been directed towards the development of POC diagnostics that meet the assured characteristics which is set out by the World Health Organization, which outline standards for evaluating POC diagnostics. Assured is an acronym which stands for Affordable, Sensitive, Specific, User-Friendly, Rapid and Robust, Equipment-Free, and Deliverable to End Users. So, a lot of research has been directed towards developing POC diagnostics that meet the assured characteristic. Why POC? The reason why POC diagnostics are important is because a lot of people residing in resource-limited settings have to travel long distances to receive medical treatment. Once they reach medical treatment facilities, they have to wait for a long period of time before they are assisted. So having POC devices will ensure that there is a faster access to test results. And this will, will allow for more rapid clinical decision making and more appropriate treatments and intervention. Another reason why POC diagnostics are important is because they increase the number of outpatient clinic visits because instead of traveling to a medical facility to have a test done, patients can use POC devices to test themselves in the comforts of their homes. There are a number of limitations to conventional diagnostic technologies. The currently available lab-based technologies are usually bulky, expensive, and require a trained personnel or technician to operate. Therefore, they are not suitable for POC use. To overcome the limitations of these systems, new or alternative approaches, such as optical biosensors, need to be explored. The aim of the current study is to present as a proof of concept the development of a biosensor system that would enable for rapid and robust detection of viral threats. The aim of the current study is to present as a proof of concept 
the development of a biosensor system that will enable for rapid and robust detection of viral threats. In order to detect HIV, HIV antibodies were immobilized on glass substrates. This is an illustration of immobilization of HIV antibodies on glass substrates for the capturing of HIV pseudoviruses. In order to immobilize HIV antibodies on glass substrates, a uniform and stable layer of silane was formed on glass substrates using a chemical called GPTMS for covalent attachment of the amine group of the HIV antibodies to the glass substrates. Once the antibodies have immobilized on the glass substrates, HIV pseudoviruses were then added to one group and the other group did not receive HIV pseudoviruses. This was then followed by the addition of HIV antibodies conjugated to selenium nanoparticles and HIV antibodies conjugated to gold nanoclusters. In the presence of HIV pseudoviruses, both selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters binds to the HIV pseudoviruses, while in the absence of HIV pseudoviruses, no binding should take place as depicted in the illustration. This is an illustration of the custom-built Raman optical setup that was used to perform Raman measurements of the surface of the substrates that I showed in the previous slides. The Raman excitation source was a 527 nanometer single mode diode laser. The laser beam from the laser, as shown by the red arrow, was directed by mirror 1 and mirror 2 as shown in the image. The laser beam was then expanded using two lens, lenses telescope L1 and L2 and delivered to the sample through a hundred times microscope objective. A dichroic, dichroic mirror was used to direct the laser beam to the back of the microscope objective lens and remove the Rayleigh scattering. The spot size of the beam at the sample was approximately 1 micron with a power of 10 milliwatts. After passing through a notch filter, the backscattered Raman signal was collected and guided to an endo spectrometer. These are the results of UVVIS absorption spectroscopy of nanoparticles conjugated to HIV antibodies. Figure A is the UVVIS absorption spectroscopy of selenium nanoparticles before conjugation with antibodies as shown by the black line and after conjugation with HIV antibodies as shown by the red line. Similarly, figure B is that of gold nanoclusters before and after conjugation with HIV antibodies. The selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters showed absorption at wavelengths of approximately 300 and 250 nanometers respectively before conjugation with HIV antibodies. After conjugation with the antibody, there was a reduction in the absorption intensity in both selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters. The decrease in the UVV spectrum intensity could indicate that successful conjugation of nanoparticles to antibodies was achieved. These are the results of the transmission electron microscopy or TEM. The nanoparticles morphology was characterized using transmission electron microscopy as shown in the image. The, Im the image shows TEM images of selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters before and after they were conjugated to HIV antibodies. The selenium nanoparticles appeared as spherical structures when observed with the TEM, while gold nanoclusters appeared as crystalline structures. The shape and morphology of selenium nanoparticles before and after conjugation to HIV antibodies remained similar 
and this suggests that the quality and morphology of selenium nanoparticles was not affected by conjugation to antibodies. Gold nanoclusters also maintained its morphology after conjugating to the antibodies. TEM also confirmed that there was no aggregation of gold nanoclusters and the clusters were well distributed while selenium nanoparticles while for selenium nanoparticles there were a number of aggregates visible before and after conjugation with HIV antibodies. The average size of selenium nanoparticles was 42 nanometers while gold nanoclusters had an average size of 3 nanometers. These are the results of the laser-induced fluorescence measurements of gold nanoclusters and selenium nanoparticles before and after conjugation with HIV antibodies. Metallic nanoparticles such as gold and semi-metallic elements like selenium have intrinsic and characteristic spectra. Figure A revealed how gold nanoclusters are highly fluorescent with peaks at around 450 and 500 nanometers. These fluorescent peaks are still observ observable for those clusters conjugated with HIV antibodies, but broadened and with much less intensity. Gold clusters possess high ratio of surface area to volume, a property that render them suitable for surface functionalization as well as conjugation with biomolecules. Hence, gold nanoclusters are potential candidates in various applications like bioimaging and biosensing. Selenium nanoparticles, on the other hand, are shown to have lower fluorescence emission than gold nanoclusters at 470 nanometers, as shown in figure B. There is no much difference in fluorescence pattern between selenium nanoparticles and those conjugated with HIV antibodies. Selenium nanoparticles have a distinct fluorescence emission in the visible to near-infrared region, which also makes them ideal for diagnostic applications. However, they are inferior with respect to fluorescence emission when they are compared to gold nanoclusters, because gold nanoclusters have a good photostability, high emission rates, and large tube shift. Fluorescence staining was done in order to determine whether the immobilized HIV antibodies on the surface of, of the glass substrates were able to capture the HIV pseudoviruses. Figure A is an image of fluorescent secondary antibody added in the presence of HIV pseudoviruses, while in figure B, the fluorescent secondary antibody was added in the absence of HIV pseudoviruses. The fluorescent secondary antibody reacts specifically with, with mouse IgG and with light chains common to other mouse immunoglobulins. Since the glass substrates were treated with HIV antibodies, which is a mouse IgG antibody, it is expected that the fluorescent secondary antibody will react with HIV antibody and show off a green fluorescence on the surface of the substrates. This was indeed the observation as shown in figure B, where the fluorescent secondary antibody was added to the substrate when the virus was not present. This result shows that HIV antibodies were successfully immobilized on the glass substrate, and this will enable the antibodies to capture the HIV viruses. In in the presence of HIV pseudoviruses, no green fluorescence was observed after the addition of the fluorescent secondary antibody. This result suggests that the fluorescent secondary antibody was not able to react with the HIV antibodies because the HIV antibodies would have bound to the HIV pseudoviruses and therefore preventing the binding of the secondary of the fluorescent secondary antibody to the mouse IgG. This is a display of the contact angle measurements performed to determine the hydrophilic properties of glass substrates 
before and after treatment with Pirana solution. Figure A shows an image before treatment, while figure B shows an image after treatment. There were changes in the contact angle for the water droplet after treatment with Pirana solution. Before treatment, the contact angle was approximately 70 degrees, which is in line with the properties of a hydrophobic substrate. After treatment, the contact angle decreased significantly and it was difficult to measure. This observation indicates that the treatment with Pirana solution introduced hydrophilic groups to the surface of the substrates and made the substrate hydrophilic, which is, an important, which is important for immobilizing biomolecules on the surface of the substrates. Atomic force microscopy, or AFM, was used to analyze the surface of the substrates and each of the scan represents a 2 by 2 micron lateral area that was scanned. The image show AFM morphologies of substrates treated with HIV antibodies, which is figure A. After treating with HIV antibodies, selenium nanoparticles conjugated to HIV antibody was, was added, which is figure B. And then C is gold nanoclusters conjugated to HIV antibody. In B and C, there were no viruses added to the substrates. D is the selenium nanoparticles conjugated to HIV antibodies and added in the presence of HIV pseudoviruses, while E is that of gold nanoclusters conjugated to HIV antibodies added in the presence of HIV pseudoviruses. In the absence of HIV pseudoviruses, there were fewer complexes that resembled selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters as shown in figure B and C. On the contrary, more structures resembling selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters were seen in the presence of HIV pseudoviruses. The roughness of the surface, the roughness of the surface increased in the surfaces with selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters conjugated to HIV antibodies in the presence of the pseudoviruses compared to when there was no HIV pseudoviruses. The root mean square roughness increased by 6 and 2 for selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters respectively in the presence of HIV pseudoviruses. This result show that immobilization of HIV antibodies was achieved and the antibodies were able to capture the pseudovirus which bound to selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters conjugated to, to HIV antibodies. The selenium nanoparticles had a larger size than gold nanoclusters, therefore induced more roughness on the surface. These are the results of the Raman measurements of glass substrates coated with various molecules. On the left is a structure of the HIV viral particle. The HIV viral particle is spherical in shape and has a diameter of approximately 120 nanometers, which is 60 times smaller than that, smaller than the size of red blood cells. The virus is surrounded by a phospholipid enveloped containing surface proteins, glycoprotein GP120 and glycoprotein GP41. On the inside, the virus has a cone-shaped HIV P24 antigen which is located on its core, which is surrounded by a matrix composed of viral protein P17. It is expected that when the virus is excited, the Raman scattered radiation will consist of bands associated with the composition of the virus. On the right, you have a figure which shows Raman measurements of glass substrates coated with virus molecules. The top panel represents 
the Raman spectra of glass substrates coated with only HIV antibodies. On the left of that image, we have a spectra where no viruses were added, while on the right, you have a spectra where viruses were added. The Raman spectra of HIV antibodies immobilized on glass substrates in the presence and absence of the virus show similarities on certain Raman peaks. The vibrations around the 900 cm minus 1 region, which arises from the stretching mode of the nitrogen to carbon to carbon, which is found in between peptide bonds. Similarly, the carbon to nitrogen stretching mode around the 1100 to 1200 region, which can be attributed to the peptide bonds formed by the amino acids of the antibody and that of the virus and that of the virus. After the 1200 region, vibrations from the Mi3 and the carbon to hydrogen functional groups are observed on both the spectra. The differences in the samples are seen from the presence of the phenyl aniline aromatic ring at 1000 region in the absence of the virus. Furthermore, the carbon to nitrogen mode is stronger in the absence of the virus compared to when the virus is present. In the presence of the virus, the aromatic rings of the tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenyl aniline are present. The differences can be attributed to the random orientation that viral molecules take when they conjugate to the antibody. The results obtained sh show that the surfaces which were treated with the virus showed characteristic peaks that represent the carbohydrates of viral glycoproteins and proteins such as enzymes and lipids. On the middle panel of the image, the spectra of gold nanoclusters in the absence or presence of the virus show similarities in the spectra around the 1200 region due to the Mi3 vibrations. In the absence of the virus, the aromatic amino acids such as tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenyl aniline are seen in 800 region and 1600 region due to, due to signal enhancement by the gold nanomaterial. In the presence of the virus, a sharp peak at 545 region arises due to disulfide bond that are present in most proteins and viruses, and this can indicate successful conjugation binding of the gold nanoclusters to the virus. On the bottom panel of the image, for selenium nanoparticles, major differences are seen on the selenium nanoparticles in the absence of the HIV pseudoviruses. In the absence of the virus, the functional groups associated with amino acids are enhanced significantly compared to the viral sample. On the viral spectrum, only the carbon to hydrogen peak was observed, was observed and no clear peaks were observed. In conclusion, we synthesized selenium nanoparticles and gold nanoclusters, and both of these nanoparticles were successfully conjugated to HIV antibodies. The conjugated nanoparticles managed to bind to HIV pseudoviruses captured by HIV antibody immobilized on the surface of glass substrates, and this was confirmed by atomic force microscopy. The Raman spectroscopy results show that the technique can be used for the detection of biomolecules on the surface of substrates and the method followed can be used to detect a wide range of biological analytes. Future studies are required to validate this, this concept with COVID-19 and other viruses with the identification of the setup limit of detection, sensitivity and selectivity. I would like to acknowledge the following sponsors for making this study possible. The Council for Scientific and Industrial Research of South Africa, the African Laser Center, the Department of Science and Technology, 
and the National Research Foundation of South Africa. Thank you.